would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Madam Mahiswari Jaganathan. She worked as a breast cancer program manager at Cancer Research Malaysia. She has been in nursing field for 19 plus years. She specialized in patient navigation, oncology nursing, palliative care and end of life nursing and also advanced lymphedemia therapy. So uh, without much uh, ado, um, I would like to welcome Mahis, uh, Miss Mahis uh, to start the uh, yeah, her presentation. Okay, Miss Mahis. Hi, hi. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Scan, to Scan for inviting uh, me to share some of my um, experience and uh, knowledge with the rest of the participants. And uh, thank you for making the time uh, to all the participants today evening. Um. So today, uh, the topic that I will be sharing is uh, how to communicate effectively with our doctors. So um, what I do at, at work uh, in Cancer Research Malaysia is uh, helping and assisting uh, breast cancer patients to complete their uh, recommended treatment at the Ministry of Health Hospital. So uh, day to, on, on a daily basis, we see many newly diagnosed breast cancer patients and also we assist many uh, breast cancer patients that does follow up to complete their treatment. So uh, currently, our patient navigation program is also available at uh, four state uh, hospitals, which is uh, based in uh, Seremban, Sabah, uh, Kuching, and also Klang. So uh, today's uh, presentation, right? The content will be some introduction on effective communication with the doctors. What are the common barriers that we see uh, faced by patients and tips before and after consultation? And uh, there will be a larger part of the um, sharing will be on patient and family rights. Right. So if, if I flash the pictures here, I'm sure that you have experienced this before in your uh, treatment journey or while you seeing patients. Uh, seeing the doctors. So as a patient, uh, on a very frequent uh, time that patient will be actually has to visit uh, their doctors in their clinical area or the hospital to make sure that they have their continuity of care being planned by doctors and their primary care treatment. Uh, if you can see, uh, there's two pictures that I can show. One is a consultation with a doctor where the patient has different emotion and then the other, the other second picture is with different emotions. So sometimes um, some of the doctor's consultation can be, uh, can, uh, is dealt by a patient in a different emotion for different reason because of their different uh, treatment milestone that they are there for. So um, sometimes we as the navigators or the nurses in the clinic sometimes do assist patient to cope with all the uh, need or the knowledge that they need to prepare them during their consultation. So in, uh, what I would like to share is the effective co uh, communication that between a doctor and, uh, uh, and, and the patient, usually it will enable the doctor to be better clinically uh, support uh, patient, improve the patient care and also the disease outcome for the patient. The three main goals, usually the doctors and the uh, doctors will have uh, to complete the doctors and the patient communication is uh, to create a very good interpersonal relationship with the patient. Uh, next, facilitate the exchange of information from the patient to the doctors so that doctors can understand what are the uh, issues or challenges or the situation that is being uh, faced by the patient. And third one is to include patient in the decision making of their uh, care. But sometimes some of the communication in the doctor's consultation can be very, very difficult and can be challenging. So I would like to share some of the common barrier that myself uh, and uh, all the other navigators see faced by patients. One is um, sometimes patients will actually uh, prefer a diff uh, 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 the doctors that come in, uh, the doctors 
who are in the consulta consultation room can be a male and sometimes uh, especially female uh, patient may uh, prefer to have a female doctors and this can also uh, make them become very discomfort and uncomfortable to have a very proper consultation second is the consultation time sometimes in a very very busy clinic especially in the government sectors the consultation times is very limited 15 to 20 minutes so in sometimes patient might have various problem that they want to see the doctor and uh, discuss but due to the limited time they might not complete uh, their their exchange of information third one is rotational doctors sometimes you might not see the same doctors again when you come for your second appointment third appointment so sometimes a patient might need to actually start from scratch to talk to the patient uh, sorry talk to the doctors on what they are actually going through and it can be also language language that is not spoken by the uh, doctors and usage of medical terms that is being used during discussion or explanation some patient may also feel fear of meeting healthcare professionals um, this is also because of they have lack of medical knowledge and uh, so when some of the information are uh, being discussed they are unable to actually uh, manage those medical information some of the patient are also very afraid of positive result that may come up some of the instruction that is being given during the consultation can be very complex which cannot be uh, managed very well by patient and sometimes during a consultation these are the common uh, co common things that the patient will tell us when they come out from the consultation i forgot to ask the doctor uh, because they they have when they go into the consultation they have many things that they want to ask but after the consultation and the discussion they forget what was actually needed for them to clarify with the doctor and then sometimes patient uh, feel that the emotion or their mindset can be not at the right uh, not at the right uh, uh, and not right for that particular uh, discussion or the consultation so they unable to participate in the discussion so they they, they become a passive they become passive and they unable to contribute to any of the consultation or discussion with the doctor and sometimes patient also feel very hesitant to ask because they think that the doctor will know best but uh, and it's very hard for them to say something uh, to challenge whatever the doctor say or to clarify things with the doctor they're very hesitant and during some of the consultation time with the doctors patient may come alone and they might not be a decision maker at that time so some of the discussion or the consultation that take place need a decision maker to make the decision or a main carer to be present to be able to give okay what can we do after this consultation and also during consultation even though they might have different perspective or different uh, expectation during the consultation some of the patient and the doctor sometimes unable to find the common ground how can i still also help the patient or how can the patient still get the benefit from the current doctor even though there can be some of the things that they are they are not agreeable or they want to go for second opinion or they want to look for different type of options you know they they unable to negotiate that term and find a common ground with the doctors and collusion are some of the one of the things that we usually see highly among cancer patients collusion is not like two cars are colliding together collusion is about when somebody uh, when some of us when one of our loved person are having a life threatening situation sometimes some of the information will be asked by the family members to not to disclose to the patient and these things can actually happen without the patient knowledge itself so this can actually become a barrier to a proper consultation and communication among patient and also doctors so some of the tip that usually we will give to our uh, patient in the navigation program is first of all before the doctor's consultation uh, take place understand what to anticipate on upcoming consultation are you going tomorrow uh, to receive the news 
after you have completed your mammogram, ultrasound and uh, biopsy, are you going, uh, going tomorrow to see the doctor to decide for a surgery? So you need to anticipate what kind of consultation is going to happen tomorrow and what are the reasons for your follow-up tomorrow. Second is discuss with the family member on the list of questions, concerns and doubts. Some of the family members might have certain uh, questions but they cannot be uh, participating in the consultation. So we hope that those family members can actually contribute and this can be actually listed and you can actually keep those information, uh, the question for you to go tomorrow for the consultation. And third one is bring someone you trust and comfortable to be in that consultation to company you. So you don't have to come all alone. And be aware of the time and prioritize the most pressing issues. Some of the patients are very good in, in communicating. So they might have maybe more than two or three types of issues that they want to disclose. But sometimes due to time and um, the, the time and the patient load in the clinic, sometimes we need to only uh, look at what is the most pressing issues at this time that the doctor has to address. So you can prioritize so that at that time, you only uh, tell them what is more important to you. Fifth one is bring your own spokesperson if you have language issues. So if you're going for a first referral and if you might talk a very uh, a different type of native languages that you are not aware that you might have a doctor who can speak the same languages, it's, it's best to bring a spokesperson that can actually speak and interpret on behalf of you to the doctors for the first time. And maybe for the second time, maybe the doctor is aware they might try to get somebody that can actually speak the same languages. And if you're going for the first referral, make sure that you bring your referral letter, your medication, your supporting document, all the other medical condition information, and all your follow-up cards. And last, please call up the clinic if you're not able to attend your appointment. Don't feel guilty and don't feel scared that you have to cancel. But you can also make sure that you take the responsibility to say and alert the team that you are unable to come and immediately get a new date after, uh, for your new consultation date. So what you can do after the doctor consultation? Sometimes a lot of information can be given uh, during the consultation. And right after doctor's consultation, what we usually advise patient is sit down and try to jot down important information on a small book before you go back so that you don't rush back and you forget certain things. And also if, you, if a patient may have more than one or two conditions like hypertension, diabetes and everything, we actually advise them to bring all the follow-up appointment cards when they come for the appointment at a different, uh, for different situation. So when you have an appointment date that is being given, you can immediately check those appointment cards and understand if there is a clash of appointments and immediately you can change there. And if you are not clear or you don't understand some of the instruction or, uh, that was given to you, consult and clarify with the nurses again before you leave. That is much better than you going back with uncertainty. And once you have written back, please put a reminder and inform your family members on the new date. So they don't wait until the last minute. Sometimes some of your spouse or your children might be actually working. So for them to block the date is very important. And for them to come for your appointment is also important. So these are some of the tips that we usually share with our patient that comes to the breast clinic. Is there any question from anyone? so far so good okay <laughs> thanks Mahis. okay right so these are the two things uh, the tips and the barriers that uh, we experience uh, facing at our clinic and uh, also uh, our uh, what the patient has actually shared with us um, the the third part of this um, presentation will be about uh, patient rights I think a lot of times um, as a patient, sometimes when you have some of uh, dissatisfaction or you find that they need improvement in your care or certain things in the hospital, we usually will encourage patients to do 
your feedback. But sometimes some of the patients are very afraid of doing what they want to improve because they worry that it will be taken very negatively. So uh, today I'm just going to share a very simple information uh, that I um, derived from uh, Institute Cancer Negara. Uh, they have come up with a poster on patient rights. So patient rights actually has been formalized from uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was formalized in 1948. It's a very um, very, very old um, document and um, it has been uh, it has been the main uh, referral point for many of um, a human rights uh, document for many countries. It has been one of the most interpreted uh, uh, document which has been interpreted for more than 500 languages and which has been used to guide many policies uh, for countries and for uh, human-based uh, services and policy. So, the basis of human uh, patient rights is where the basis of a concept of the person and the fundamental dignity and equality of all human beings that the notion of patient right was developed. In other words, what is owed to the patient as human being by physician and by the state took shape in large part thanks to this understanding of basic right of a person. So the patient rights um, can be different for different countries and it can, be, it can be also different between the government and also the private uh, practices, but we might share the same principle. So you might, uh, uh, you might see some of the patient rights in some of the uh, hospitals, lobbies and everything so that uh, those information will be actually uh, been uh, be put up for patient, uh, for many of the customers' uh, attention. So there is, all, um, there is almost about 17 human rights, uh, sorry, patients' rights. The first uh, patient and family rights are you are valued and treated with respect and dignity. The second one is any patient has to receive a description of surgery, procedures, and tests to be performed before giving permission to treatment. So before uh, the doctor would take any of your consent for any kind of treatment, it is a must for the patient to receive a description what type of a surgery is being done and why those surgery is the most best option and what are the tests will be performed before even the patient will actually sign the permission for treatment. The third patient and family right is the patient has the right to receive effective and timely treatment regardless of age, gender, race, religion, and economic status professionally from the healthcare uh, providers. And patient has the right to know the status of their health, the latest treatment that is available, the disease development, and further treatment planning that is being done for the patient. The fifth one is the patient has the right to select hospital, institution or facilities as well as the type of treatment required. So if the patient wants to go and select a different hospital or a different institution, their wishes or their preference has to be given uh, the priority. Unless there is some consent of their, uh, some consent, and uh, those concerns will be uh, will be uh, related to the, uh, will be relate to the patient, and sometimes it might require for patient to actually sign at your own risk that you are coming out from the hospital. But they have they have the rights to select which kind of hospital or institution or facility they want to go. The patient also have the uh, right to obtain privacy during the treatment and all your treatment information is confidential and it cannot be accessed by outside parties without your permission. The seventh right is the patient has all the right to be called with the correct name and also know the information of the health personnel involved in the treatment process. So most of the doctors or the healthcare professional will introduce themselves and tell who are they and what are their roles and what kind of expertise they bring into your care. 
so that you are aware about uh, their expertise in your uh, treatment uh, plan. The eight patient right is, patient has the right to involve family members in discussion and make decisions related to care and treatment. So if you see Asian uh, families from the Asian countries are very much, uh, will, allow, will uh, prioritize family involvement in decision making. They are very much different with the Western countries. So some of the decision are not, uh, is, is being required for patient to do without the family members discussion. So this will be very different with the Asian and Western uh, patients. The nine right is the patient has the right to obtain information and advice on the treatment given by the doctors before leaving the ward. If patient is admitted and they admitted for some uh, a few days before they leave, they have to have the summary of information of what was given to them, what was the medication given, and uh, what are their future plans before they leave the ward. Ten. The patient has the right to be informed about the services which is not available and referred to relevant government hospital, institution and facilities. So uh, some of the government hospitals, sometimes they don't have uh, certain expertise. So they will pool their resources and they might refer a different type of government hospitals so that they might be having the services in other hospitals. So they have the right to refer the patient and do not um, keep the patient in, in that particular hospital if they don't have the expertise or the resources to treat the patient. Eleven, the patient has the right to obtain the view and opinion of second parties. So if in the consultation, there is some um, information that the patient is, uh, information that the patient wants and she prefer a second opinion before they, they go into decision making, she has to relate these to her main primary care, uh, primary doctors to tell that I wish to get a second opinion. And when you are getting a second opinion, it is very, very important to get the first doctor who have seen the patient to write what was the finding so that she will bring the first finding result and the first um, plan of the doctors to go to the second party so that they can actually do a comparison and decide what is best for the patient. Twelve, the patient has the right to get, get an assessment and get involved in managing her health level. Thirteen, the patient has the right to communicate in the language you understand and entitled to translation. So some situations, some of the uh, native languages sometimes cannot be... Um, you, you can't find... Uh, these uh, native speakers in uh, healthcare professional. So is the best is for you to always bring somebody who can actually do the translation with you so that the, the information can be given to you at the critical time in a proper way so that you don't uh, wait for, for, for the healthcare professional to, to get those languages. It's best that you, you can communicate in a, in, a, in a language that both sides can understand. 14, the patient has the right to, in, uh, to be informed about the treatment charges and entitled for social welfare facilities if needed. So social, uh, there is um, medical social welfare department in all the government hospitals in Malaysia. So if, you, if any of the patient is finding difficulty or having issues with their financial, they can actually speak to the doctor and get a referral straight to the social medical social welfare department in the government hospital so that some of the charges and some of the uh, payment can either be absorbed or can be paid in a, in a smaller amount, but patient can still receive their treatment. 15, the patient has the right to decide on organ donation and donate organs with your permission of your or your family. 16, the patient has the right to agree or refuse to participate in the medical studies. So sometimes when you are taking part in uh, um, medical studies, there's always a clause there. At any time, uh, when you feel that you don't want to be part of the studies, you can actually cancel your participation. 
this is um, solely uh, based on voluntary. And the last one, uh, number 17, is the patient has the right to ex uh, have the right to express concern, dissatisfaction, complaint, feedback, or suggestion for improvement related to the services or the treatment. So this information is actually taken uh, from the National Institute of Cancer Malaysia. And uh, these, are, uh, these are the patient and the family uh, rights that has been um, endorsed by the Malaysian Hospital Accredited Standard. It's a fourth edition and it, the last version is uh, been uh, circulated in January 2013. And we are still using this. And this has been uh, updated in 2017 in uh, National Cancer Institute. So, is there any other question that some uh, any of the participants would like to ask? Maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. Any question from the audience? So, I, I did one. not see any. I uh, have one question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Um, I think number 12 was uh, something to do with assessment. Can you elaborate on that? Assessment? Yep. Right. Hold on. Okay, so get an assessment and get involved in managing your health level. So sometimes um, some of the patient might come in, um, let's say I, I, I'm giving you a, just a, a different type of scenario. If patient is coming in for uh, recurrence, right, they would be evaluated back on assess and to what level currently they are at this moment, maybe staging or they look at their CT scan. So they, they have to be given a second assessment and need to be involved in managing their health level. Actually, there is uh, a more detailed information on, on uh, the assessment and the criteria. And these are just a uh, very simple one for the general, uh, general understanding. But I can actually uh, try to give you the very detailed criteria in this uh, number 12, uh, right? Thank you. Uh, Mahis, there's one question. Uh, can patients practice these rights with insurance companies? As some insurance companies have their own panel of hospitals. Right. right. Okay. I'm going to... So, uh, patient rights and patient and the family rights, right? The one that I'm reading at this moment, this is uh, been endorsed in uh, Malaysian Hospital Accreditation Standard. So, if you, I'm sure that the the insurance uh, insurance company also have their rights and based on uh, their their policy, there's also different clauses. But you can actually bring this and actually check with your agent and see whether there is some overlap or there is a clause that will actually block some of your uh, patient and family rights that is being uh, shared by the Ministry of Health. Okay. So, um, so, um, Bhuvanis, does that um, answer your question? Um, yes and no. So, <laughs> yes and no, yeah. Because yeah. you said this is uh, public, but most of the um, insurance is for private hospitals. Yes. So I'm sure this also applies to private hospitals, right? Uh, okay. There is... Um, the, the patient rights currently, right? It is very different for different practices. So this is, can be used as guide, but you can... It, because it has some, uh, um, some of the legal and medical legal things in the patient rights. So sometimes these are being endorsed in the Ministry of Health hospitals. So I, I don't think so that you can actually take these and um, 
take the patient right, which has been endorsed by the KKM, the Ministry of Health, to the insurance company. Because I'm sure that your policies has different clauses as well, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, thanks. Now I understand. Yeah. Luckily, it prevented me from going and fighting with my insurance. No. Because, <laughs> and, and, and also, uh, this is a, a fourth edition, which was in January 2013. So, I was like very careful, uh, look at all the things. So, I came out with what, uh, what are the, the most um, common and general uh, patient rights was available. So we choose the Institute uh, Cancer Nagara's uh, patient and human, uh, sorry, uh, patient and family rights, which they shared as a poster. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mahi. Thank you. Okay, there's actually one question from myself, uh, Mahis. If assuming the rights are denied or maybe the service provided is inferior, mm -hmm. so are we, the next step, is it legal, you know, um, feedback and then legal or, or I mean, what, what would be the next step? Okay, if, if, you, if you think there was a breach of uh, your right, based mm -hmm. on the, uh, the rights that I've uh, shared with you. This is from Ministry of Health, right? So I, I suppose that you are relating to uh, services that you received in the Ministry of Health hospitals? No, this was uh, my husband in a private uh, right. hospital yeah. after an operation. <laughs> yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this is basically, it's been endorsed by Ministry of Health hospital. So mm -hmm. the private hospital may have different type of rights. And uh, in, in private hospital, you also sign a declaration form. So sometimes mm -hmm. when you sign, there is a clause in that declaration form. Okay. So you need to look at that. So, but if you have some of, uh, if you think that you want to bring this out and you want to clarify this, you can actually uh, write to the Ministry of Health, uh, Bahagian Aduan, asking for their advice. But you have to write a, chrono a chronological uh, uh, event chronological issue, event uh. issue and uh, what was your problem and how was it deal? So you shouldn't write as a complaint. Like you want to ask for Improvement. suggestion. Yeah. Improvement yeah. suggestion. Yeah. So, I mean, it's going to take like, you know, with the rate no, they, takes ages. <laughs> uh, no, they, how they follow respond. up, you know. Mm. No, they respond very fast. Oh, In very one. fast. Oh. Very fast, yeah. I mean... Most of the time, we would talk maybe uh, feedback to the hospital, but most of the time, the hospital say, oh, this is our way of doing things, and they just brush it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, any more questions? Wait, uh, um, I am opening up now. Um, sorry. My computer is a bit slow. Um, I have one question here. Uh, why, why not go ahead? Yeah, Gunloi. Yeah, Mahesh. Um, yeah. It's related to this, uh, what do you call that? Do not resuscitate, right? Typically, yes. my understanding from doctors are that uh, cancer patients typically will be put to D and R. Uh, I'm not sure how much people understand that. Mm -hmm. And does it really apply to all cancer patients who are actually receiving treatment or... Does it include cancer survivor? I guess not, right? Only patients who are still receiving treatment, like late stage patients. All right. Uh, so the the there is a so when somebody is receiving uh, treatment at a hospital and they are very ill and uh, mm -hmm. there will be a conversation with the doctors and the family members. There will be explanation telling that oh. if, if somebody is having cancer and mm -hmm. uh, does the family allow and wish to, to resuscitate when uh, they have a life-threatening situation or stop breathing. Uh, this can be also families wish to resuscitate or not resuscitate. But there is a new, um, it's called the patient directive. This has been, um, uh, this is currently available in Penang. So patient, anybody can actually do a directive telling them in any of their um, a disease situation, if they go into coma or it, it's something like a will, but they give a direction in any time of they stop breathing 
or or they are not in their best uh, situation to be resuscitated or they don't want to be intubated they leave that directive to the is is a letter that they leave the directive so not only the family cannot overtake this is like a wish that the patient wants currently this is not uh, is is not available widely in in, in malaysia mm-hmm. but uh, these are called uh, these are under your ethic ethics of how do you want uh, certain things to be done as your right mm. what about if a patient uh, undergoing treatment and then somehow um he or she went into a very emergency situation that have been uh um you know sent to hospital and then went into coma almost immediately uh so is that like automatically the patient will not be given this uh resuscitation <laughs> that's curious I think it will be uh, it will be the uh, it will be the decision making and the assessment of the patient at that time. Let's say Obviously. the patient is already unconscious at that time. Unconscious, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, like a very dangerous situation already. Um, is it all up to the emergency department? Yeah, it's all depends on the, the emergency department and her current. current situation at that time she can be a cancer oh. patient previously but due to that time like people can be cancer patient but mm. uh, during the emergency she might be having something else so they might be treating her current condition that is affecting mm. her entire system so it will be basically will be the uh, the, the team who's uh, handling her will decide what is best for her at that time okay i see all right mm. thanks Okay, uh, uh, we have one question from PL. If I have two consulting doctors from different hospitals with different opinion with regards to hormone replacement medication, one asks to take another advice not to. How or what do I do? <laughs> so, sometimes... Um, uh, Uh, first when you go for um second opinion right uh, we always advise patient make sure you bring the first doctor who see you to go for the second opinion so there's already an opinion to uh, the second opinion doctor so when the second opinion is actually giving an advice for you to take this medicine there should be a rational of why this particular doctor is actually telling her that this is the best if you think this two people the both first opinion and the second opinion is not enough you can go for third opinion and ask mm, which okay. can you follow mm, okay so third opinion okay great third opinion so oh, pl uh, yeah. okay uh, oh. pl um, paling right pay, i'm not sure paling <laughs> yeah yeah okay oh sometimes yes, some yes. of pay, yes. uh, paling right so sometimes y- you can also ask the doctors if they would like to talk to each other oh okay oh okay. good <laughs> idea they talk to it, each other sometimes right it, it can be some uh, just uh, uh, paper information and you, you are this, like you you bring the information and go to the first opinion then the first opinion don't know what why the second uh, second opinion doctor is telling you certain thing so actually you can actually do that uh, we we actually ask many doctors to talk to each other and and close the bridges so that okay. you know in the best of patients uh the best for patients lah mm-hmm. okay okay all right thank you okay the next one is from kc wong for those who are seeking treatment at government hospital how often do they get the chance to consult the oncologist most of the time <laughs> they are attended by mo <laughs> uh, yeah that, that one i think i can answer lah huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay we'll really go ahead sure Frequent patient to GH are up to you. If we are talking about Kuching, uh, Sarawak General Hospital, typically a patient don't really get a lot of opportunity to see the oncologist. The reason very simple because there are very very few oncologists having to attend to many 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 patients. Mm-hmm. The ratio is just not quite right. Mm-hmm. So we have many experienced medical officers there to help. 
And whenever they actually, if they are in out, they always also consult the oncologist as needed. And uh, a few scenario where patients will get to see an oncologist where they have, will be maybe they will have uh, something like a very unique situation they encounter. Uh, or, sorry to say, when they have recurrence, they will see the oncologist. Uh, yeah, or sometimes yeah. once in a while, a special occasion where they need some, um, the oncologist help to work on something related to insurance, something to clarify maybe. Yeah, so most of the case, um, it is the uh, medical officers. Mm. So that is Joanna, right? Casey Wong is Joanna, right? Okay, Joanna, you understand the situation now here? Yeah. So this is something... Uh, our, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, our cancer advocacy group is trying to fight for more oncologists in the hospital so that our patients get to see oncologists more frequent than now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bundui. Yes. So, uh, one more question for Anna Hui. Um, would like to know under what circumstances a uh, breast cancer patient will get financial support from SOSCO? So, Bundui again. <laughs> this is not about communication issue with doctors, ah. Huh? <laughs> I know they. they, they, they Beneficial to some of us, uh, I don't mind, I take a little bit of time to share. Yeah. Uh, for SOSO, it's typically for age 60 and below. And uh, for breast cancer or any other cancer type, it's typically for advanced stage uh, cancer patients that you can apply in validity pension scheme. This is um, most directly uh, uh, associated ones. Huh? The scheme available is invalidity, pen invalidity pension scheme for advanced stage cancer patients. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, any more, any more question? Um, based on what I see, that's it. Any more question from um for 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 our speaker Mahis? No, very quiet. Okay, so I think we are on time. So a lot of thanks to uh, Mahis for your wonderful and informative um presentation. So I think we all learn a, a lot that there's rights involved, not just uh, whatever doctors say is yes, man. So I think um, we, we, we gain a lot today. So um, hopefully all of us will make good use of today's information. Okay. So okay. the next, the next uh, agenda will be uh, sharing in our breakout session. So Chris, you want to take over? Yeah, uh, let me just set up the breakout rooms. Mm. Uh, perhaps for those uh, friends who are uh, oh. joining us for the first time, the sharing session within the smaller group would be um, a discussion or sharing among the small group. So um, we will should respect each other, not to yes. disclose outside of the small group. Lah, unless uh, uh, one of you, maybe some of you think you want to share openly, you can come back to the big group to share. Up to you. Yeah. Uh, before we break into the breakout rooms, can we just say thank you to Mahesh for giving us this talk? Give a clap. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Yeah, let's clap. <laughs> and I'm going to stop the recording yeah. now. <laughs>